Thanks for visiting my reading room. We're continuing in Chapter 8 of Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys Mystery, um, Danger Overseas. Joe. Vanessa stared at me across the cluttered office. Shock and anger warred with each other in her face, and I knew that if I wanted to control the situation, I'd have to keep up my offensive. I pointed to the crate with the vases. You want to tell me what, what these are doing here, I demanded, or should we take it to the university sponsors and you can explain to them? I started to lift the crate. In fact, I think that's what we should do. It would be the proper protocol, wouldn't it? No, Vanessa burst out, and I knew I had her. I straightened up and faced her, folding my arms. All right, then. Maybe you can explain it to me, I said. Who are you? Vanessa asked in a trembling voice. I knew there was something funny about you and your brother just turning up here without anyone knowing where you'd come from, and you obviously know nothing about archaeology. I was hurt. I thought I'd been doing a great job of sifting dirt. Were you sent here to check up on me? Vanessa asked. I realized I had to tread carefully here. If I said too much, she might realize how little I actually knew. But if I had to convince her that I was the voice of authority, so she'd tell me the truth. We were sent here, yes, I said. We're working with the Italian authorities, then I frowned. But I'm not here to answer questions. I'm here to ask them. So tell me, who is this Petrelli guy? How does the scam work? How do you get the pots off site without anyone noticing they're missing? Vanessa looked bewildered. Are you talking about these pots here? Why did anyone notice they're missing? She asked. They're not from the dig. I blinked. You mean you're stealing from other digs as well? Stealing? Vanessa looked even more confused. Of course not. I would never steal artifacts from a dig. That would be a violation of history. Well, if you're not stealing, then how do you explain these pots? I asked. I was starting to get annoyed. Did she think I was stupid? Did I believe her denials with the evidence right there at my feet? You mean you don't? Oh my goodness, Vanessa exclaimed. She put her hand over her mouth. You thought I'd been nicking things from the dig and selling them. And I thought you were after me for the knockoffs. I must have had a bewildered look myself now because she glanced at me and explained, the pots in the crates, they're fakes knockoffs. I'm a potter, and I'm also an archaeologist, so I know how to make pots the way the Romans did, and then how to make them look properly aged so that people think they're actual antiques. It's not illegal. It's not illegal, she went on quickly as I opened my mouth. At least not on my, not my part of it. I never claimed they were anything but historical accurate copies, but the antique dealers you sell them to are reselling them as the real thing, I guessed. I don't know that for a fact, Vanessa argued, looking uncomfortable. You suspect, though, don't you? She sagged. Please, you don't have to tell anyone here, do you? It's not illegal, but it is a bit, well, unsavory. It won't do my career any good. I perched on the edge of her desk. I don't yet know whether I can keep you out of it, I said. We're working on a, a bigger investigation. Obviously, I can't give you details on that, but I think it's safe to say we're not after you. I can try to keep your part of things quiet, but I'm going to need your cooperation. Vanessa nodded eagerly. Anything, she said. Tell me how I can help. First of all, tell me more about this scam of yours, she winced when I used the word scam, but I went on. How long have you been doing it and why? Why jeopardize your career by making forgeries? It's my younger brother, Vanessa said sadly. Anthony, I've always been sort of a mother to him. Our mom died when he was just a kid and I suppose he's a bit dependent on me. He's also addicted to gambling. He had a bad losing streak a while back and apparently he borrowed money from a gangster, a loan shark, to pay it off. She sighed, and now, of course, everything is ten times worse. The loan shark wants his money back, plus an outrageous amount of interest, and Tony can't pay it, and the sum keeps getting bigger every day, and now Tony is afraid he's going to be killed. I shook my head. How did people get themselves into these crazy messes? He phoned me a month ago, frightened out of his mind, Vanessa went on. I sent him all the money I had, but a week later he needed more. The only thing I could think of was to make a lot of money quickly was to do this. She waved at the pots. They pay me 200 euro a piece for them. I can make about four a week. If I work on them every night, it's quite an involved process, see, with a lot of steps to it. 200 euro times four? 
So you're making 800 euro a week on these pods? I said, impressed. Over a thousand dollars. That's not bad. It all depends how you look at it, Vanessa retorted. I look at this at his, uh, at, at it as meaning I'll have to keep doing it for months to pay off Tony's debt. And it's worn me out. I'm up all night, every night, making the pots. And then I'm here all day, every day. That's why you're so irritable, I guessed. Vanessa let out a short laugh. Have I? Uh, sorry about that. I, I didn't notice. I've been so worried. I haven't really been paying attention to the dig at all. So when you get phone calls at the dig, it's that mostly your brother calling you? I, I wanted to know. Sometimes it's Tony, Vanessa said. I also have to make a lot of arrangements with the various dealers I sell to. It takes time. She moved to the long table and gathered together the dirty coffee mugs, staring at them blankly. And today the man Tony owes the money to rang me. I suppose Tony must have told him where the payments were coming from. He told me that I needed to pay faster. Her chin wobbled. How can I do that? I can't possibly work any harder or faster than I am now. Can't Tony pitch in? I asked. She shook her head. He's in college. He's got to keep up with his studies. Tony sounded like a bit of a jerk. I thought, but I, I didn't say. He had enough time to pile up a massive gambling debt, but not enough time to help his sister get him out of the mess he'd made. Still, that wasn't really the, the point right now. Look, let me talk to the people I work with, I said. We might be able to help you out. Do you know the name of this loan shark your brother borrowed from? Vanessa hand went to the frame of her rectangular glasses and she adjusted them nervously. Won't that put Tony in danger if I give this man's name to the police? We'll be very discreet, I assured her. She bit her lips. It's a man called Fat Hamish. I don't know his surname. He's in London. Okay, I said, nodding. Tonight I'll talk to the people I work with and see if they can't find some way to get this Fat Hamish character to back off. Now, I need you to help me if you can. You remember Sam Lewis, the kid who got arrested for trying to sell those artifacts? Of course, Vanessa said. She carried the dirty mugs over to the tiny sink in the corner and began scrubbing them. My promise of help seemed to have given her new energy. He was a good worker, she said over her shoulder. And he seemed very serious about archaeology. I was surprised when he stopped showing up. I assumed that girlfriend of his must have had something to do with it. Caitlin. I didn't care for her. She was forever distracting him, trying to get him to leave work and spend time with her. I was ever so shocked when I heard about him getting arrested, though. He never struck me as the criminal type. Any idea how he got hold of the artifacts that he tried to sell? I asked. Vanessa carried the clean mugs back to the table and began scooping papers into piles. Uh, this place is such a mess. On the next rainy day, I've got to get in here and sort out all the paperwork, she muttered. In a louder voice, she added, I don't know for a fact how he got hold of them, but I assume it must have been once they were at the BS and T warehouse when I heard about the case. I checked our catalog, and all those artifacts he tried to sell were listed as having been sent out to BS and T already. But of course, taking them from BS and T would have been dead easy for Sam. I looked at Vanessa in surprise. Why do you say that? Well, because Caitlin worked there. Of course, Vanessa said. She arched her eyebrows at me. Didn't you know? I think my jaw actually dropped. We hadn't known that, and it seemed like a big oversight. Yes, Sam told me he'd gotten her a job there. I think it must have been off the books since she didn't have authorization to work in Italy. Vanessa added, they needed some extra help in the office, filing, that sort of thing. That explained it. ATAC would have access to only the official list of employees from bs &T. If Caitlin had been working there illegally, there would have been no record of it and no way for ATAC to know. I rubbed my chin thoughtfully. It now seemed clear to me how the theft had worked. Caitlin had stolen the things from bs &T and then given them to Sam to sell, which meant that, more than likely, there was no theft ring or conspiracy at the dig. We were barking up the wrong tree. Of course, Frank and I would have to confirm this, but it seemed that our investigation was pretty much over. A grin broke over my face. Wait till I, I told my big brother I'd cracked the case on my own, and that this time there would be no masked goons or other assorted thugs to deal with. He'd be so happy. Speaking of Frank, I wondered again where he'd gotten to. All right, Vanessa, you've helped out. You've helped with this investigation, and I appreciate it. 
I told her. We'll see what we can do to get your brother off the hook with Fat Hamish. I'll get back to you in a couple of days with something more concrete. And don't worry, I think I can promise that we won't need to reveal what you've been doing on the side. Thanks very much. Oh, it's such a relief to have someone to turn to, Vanessa said. Now that her secret was out in the open, she seemed like a different person. Friendly, helpful, basically pretty nice. I'd give anything to be able to stop making these knockoff pots, and I will as soon as I know that Tony's safe. Nodding to her, I left the trailer. As soon as I was outside, I pulled my I pulled out my phone to call Frank. The phone was switched off. I must have forgotten to turn it on that morning, which meant that maybe Frank had tried to reach me to let me know where he was going. Whoops. Whatever. I switched it on and hit Frank's speed dial number. Where have you been? was my brother's greeting to me. I've been trying to call you for hours. Did you get my text? Sorry, phone was turned off, I told him, but... I'm going to lose the connection in a second. I'm on a train going into a tunnel. He cut me off. Meet me back at our room and we'll talk. I've got a few leads. I've got more than that, I started to say, but when I realized I was speaking into a dead phone, my big brother had hung up on me. Frank. Joe reached our dorm about 15 minutes after me. I'd been pacing the room, waiting for him. Man, you would not believe the day I've had, I burst out as, he, as soon as he walked into the door. Do you know that I was attacked by two Rottweilers? Not one, but two. And I whacked my shin really hard, too, and made a fool of myself in front of a pretty girl, I almost added. But that was too embarrassing to talk about. Whoa, whoa, slow down, brother, Joe said, raising his hands. Where were you attacked by Rottweilers? What were you doing? Didn't you even look at the text I sent you? I asked. I went to the B.S. and T. offices. Really? Now that's a coincidence, Joe said. A little funny smile crossed his face again. Go on. Why is it a coincidence, I asked. No, no, I'll tell you my news after you tell me yours, Joe said, waving a hand. His smile got wider. Whatever, I grumbled. After the day I'd had, I was feeling pretty irritable. If Joe wanted to act mysterious, let him. <laughs> I told him about my trip. Joanna Paoli's suspicious behavior and my encounter with the dogs. It's not much to go on, but I have, but I just have a hunch there's a connection at BS and T. I finished. I think we need to focus our investigation there. I agree that BS and T is key, Joe said, but I think the investigation is pretty much over. His smile became broad, triumphant, a grin. I cracked the case this afternoon, bro, all by my little self. What? I stared at him. There is no theft ring, Joe said, at least not one involving the people here at the dig. Sam's girlfriend, Caitlin, is the key. She worked at BS&T, and, and I'm sure she's the one who stole the artifacts that Sam tried to sell. How do you know this? I demanded, flabbergasted. Long story, which I'll go into later. The short version is that I got Vanessa to open up, Joe said airily. Apparently, Sam got Caitlin a job at BS&T, working off the books, which, by the way, is why ATAC didn't know about it. She was in a perfect position to steal stuff from their warehouse, and from what I've heard, she was sort of a shifty character. Yeah, I said slowly. I heard the same thing. Wow, this does put a whole new spin on things, doesn't it? Nice work, Joe. Thank you, thank you, Joe made a little bow. And sorry about your running with the Rottweilers. I was hoping we could get out of this mission without any mauling at all. But I guess these days, no case is complete until Big Bro gets himself in trouble. Remember when it used to be the other way around? Don't remind me, I groaned. The good old days, Joe said in a mock wistful voice. You know, it's not quite over, I said after a moment. We now have a pretty good idea of how Sam got hold of those artifacts. But we still need to try to find actual evidence. Best thing would be if we could track down this Caitlin girl herself. Right. And if that means we have to stay in Rome a few extra days, well, I guess we'll just have to grin and bear it. Joe put me in a laugh. I ignored that. I'm going to email ATAC and see what they can dig up on Caitlin. The other thing is, before we close the book, for sure on the idea of a theft ring, I'd like to nose around some more about those emerald-eyed lions that everybody seems to think should have been dug up by now. I forgot about those. Joe walked over to the chair and flung himself down. Do you really think there's a crime here? I mean, couldn't those things have been dug up hundreds of years ago? Or maybe the Emperor Claudius or whoever had them removed way back when? 
Maybe he decided they looked better in one of his other houses. You're probably right, I agreed. I'd just like to do a little more investigating before we give up here. You know, I added as the thought struck me, Nancy and her friends might be able to help us find Caitlin. We can find we can ask tomorrow when we see them anyway. I like the way you think, Joe said, and I'm sure you're making that suggestion. Uh, has nothing to do with you having a crush on Nancy, does it? Shut up, I growled and wha <laughs> and whacked Joe in the side of the head. I just think it would have it would help to have a few extra people if there's a lot of legwork to do. Uh-huh, whatever you say, Joe murmured <laughs> with an annoying twinkle in his eye. Okay, so what's on our to-do list? I'll email ATAC now, I said. Then tomorrow, we need to go back to bs and and see if we can find out more about Caitlin. By which I mean, you need to go back to bs and I can't go there. That girl Joanna already suspicious of me, I frowned. It looks like there's not much point to our continuing to work on the dig. I hope Vanessa isn't too upset to lose us. Don't worry, I can make it right with her, Joe said. By the way... I promised her I'd call in a favor with Atac for her. Wait till I tell you her story. I listened to what he had to say as I booted up my computer. I had to admit my little bro had done some good work today, even if I hadn't. Yes, I thought, even though it had involved Rottweilers, this was one of our easier and more fun assignments. Too bad it seemed like it was ending already. I hoped Atac would at least let us hang out a few days and take in some of the sights. It seemed like not much to ask after we'd completed our mission in record time. Little did I know, this case was far from closed. Chapter 9, Nancy, Lily of the Valley By bedtime, I was wondering if I'd made a huge mistake. The trouble had begun almost as soon as we got home. Anna still <clears throat> had welcomed Lily with her trademark graciousness and generosity. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm sure we can fit another place in at dinner, she'd said. Ugo will be delighted to add another pretty face to his table. Lily had tugged my arm. I don't want to go out, she'd whispered to me. Her lips trembled. I'm scared. I'm tired, and I want to take a bath. Can't we just stay here tonight? I'd been looking forward to this dinner ever since Aunt Estelle had told us about it. Her friend Ugo Artam came from a wealthy old family, and he apparently lived in some sort of castle just outside Rome filled with art and antiques and clanking suits of armor. The pensione we were staying in was just an extra apartment he used when he had business that kept him overnight in the city. I'd never met anyone who lived in a castle before, and Anastel said his dinner parties were legendary. But Lily was so frail, so vulnerable, it wasn't right to drag her out after all she'd been through, and it wouldn't be right to leave her here on her own either. I swallowed my disappointment. Anna Estelle, I'm really sorry to do this, I said, but I think Lily needs a quiet evening. I'm happy to stay here with her while you all go to Mr. Artem's party. Please give him my best and tell him I hope I can visit another time. Anna Estelle pursed her lips. All right, she said after a moment. I suppose you're right. But once Anna Estelle, Bess, and George were gone, Lily didn't settle down the way I thought she would. She prowled from room to room of the big old apartment, picking up things, fingering things. Man, this guy must really be rich if this is his spare apartment, she said. She pointed to a small, dim, charcoal drawing of a woman's face that hung on the wall in, her, in the foyer. That's a sketch of Tipolo's meeting of Anthony and Cleopatra, and I think it's real. Wow, I said, impressed. Then something else hit me. Hey, how do you know all that? I asked about the drawing. Lily shrugged. I don't know. Why does it matter? It tells me something about you, I told her. I drummed my fingers on a tabletop. Maybe you're an artist or an art history student. Huh. Hilly cocked her head to one side as she thought about that. Maybe I am, she sighed. I thought if I figured out something about me that was really, really true, you know, it would sort of click into place and I'd be like, oh yeah, that's right, but I'm not getting that feeling. <clears throat> it might not work that way, I told her gently. I don't know much about amnesia, but it might just be that your memories need time to rebuild themselves. Seeing an opening, I went on. You know, I really do think we should take you to a doctor tomorrow. Medicine might be able to help you in ways that I can't. We'll see. Lily said in a vague way and started prowling again. 
I had the feeling she was trying to avoid the subject. Suddenly she turned to me. Hey, you want to get out of here? I feel sort of restless. I stared at her in puzzlement. Lily, you just told me all you wanted to do is stay in and take a bath. If you wanted to go out, we should have gone to Mr. Artem's dinner party. Oh, that sounded so stuffy, Lily said, waving her hand. Who wants to spend that evening with a bunch of old people? She must have seen my expression because she quickly added, I mean, I really did feel exhausted and I do want to take a bath, but I'm starting to get some energy back. I think it's because I'm not scared right now. I feel safe with you, she offered but a, uh, with a smile. But this time... I wasn't buying her routine. I really wanted to go to that dinner party, I told her. I've been looking forward to it all day. I stayed here because I thought you needed it, and now I find you just thought you could come up with something better to do. I'm sorry, Lily said in a pathetic little voice. Don't be mad at me. I pressed my lips together to avoid letting, her, letting out an angry retort. Turning, I walked into the living room and stood by the window, gazing out at the cityscape while I struggled with my exasperation. After a minute or two, I'd cooled down. Why don't you go take that bath, I suggested to Lily. I'll put together some dinner for us. I'm starving, aren't you? There are a few things in the kitchen. Okay, Lily padded off toward the bathroom while I went into the kitchen. I heard the water start to run into the bathtub. Rummaging through the refrigerator produced some excellent results. Aunt Estelle, who was a good cook, had made a great bolognese sauce a couple of nights before, full of meat and vegetables simmered in a tomato cream sauce, and there was plenty left over. Just needed reheating. I put some water on to boil the for pasta and threw together some salad greens and sliced tomatoes. There was a hunk of goat cheese in the fridge, so I added that to the salad, too. I set the salad bowl on the table with oil and vinegar. I was enjoying myself. At home, I, was some, I sometimes kept... At home, I sometimes help our housekeeper, Hannah Gruen, in the kitchen, but I don't often put together a meal by myself. While I waited for the water to boil, I went back into the living room and popped one of my favorite CDs into the player. Humming along under my breath, I sat down and picked up a fold-out map of Rome that was sitting on the coffee table. I found the Villa Borghese gardens and studied the area around them trying to see if there was anything that would help me to get some idea of what had happened to Lily. I'd been thinking about what she'd said at the very beginning about that nightmare she had right before she woke up in the park. Of course, it could have been just a coincidental bad dream, but what if it wasn't? What if she really had been locked up somewhere dark and damp and smelly? Was there any place like that near the Borghese Gardens? I shook my head in frustration. The map was just a tourist map. It couldn't tell me anything useful, like where the bad neighborhoods were, or if there were underground caves anywhere. I wondered if there was any way I could jog Lily's memory. It could be dangerous, I knew, to try making an amnesia patient or victim remember painful events. The results were impossible to predict, but maybe we could talk after dinner, when she was a little more relaxed and felt more secure. I went into the kitchen and checked the pasta water. It was boiling, so I added a handful of linguine. I crossed to the bathroom and knocked on the door. Dinner will be ready in a few minutes. How's the bath going? I called. No answer. Lily? I called. When there was still no answer, I opened the door a crack and peeked in. The tub was full of water and the air was full of steam, but Lily wasn't in there. My heart thudded. I had instantaneous visions of mysterious men in black kidnapping her from the tub. Where was she? What could have happened to her? I spun around and let out a yelp of surprise. Lily was standing in the doorway of Bess and George's room, wearing a pink terry, clo terry cloth robe and a towel around her hair. You scared me to death. I didn't know where you were, I said, taking a deep breath to get my pulse under control. What are you doing in Bess and George's room? You're sharing a room with me, remember? I got confused about which one it was, Lily said, shrugging, went, went into the wrong one. I frowned as if I recognized the robe. Isn't that Bess's robe? Is it? Lily glanced down at it. It was hanging in the bathroom, so I just put it on. You don't think she'll mind if I borrow it, do you? I guess not, I said somewhat absently. I was thinking, I don't remember seeing Bess's robe hanging in the bathroom today. In fact, I specifically remembered seeing it lying across her bed when I'd gone in there to borrow some hand cream. 
just before they all left for dinner. Lily was lying. I wasn't sure why. Maybe it wasn't the most polite thing to do, but it wasn't a crime for her to go into Bess's room and borrow her robe. But the fact that she had lied about it set off alarm bells in my head. Lily was a thief. Had she taken anything? While she went into our room to get dressed, I popped into Bess and George's room and quickly scanned the dressers and tabletops. I didn't notice anything obvious out of place, but that didn't comfort me all that much. There was no way for me to tell if anything was missing. I made a mental note to tell Bess and George to check over their belongings later. When Lily came to the table to eat, she looked at the bowl of linguine I'd, let out, I'd set out for her and made a face. Does that have meat in it? She asked. Yes, it does, I said, not trying trying not to get annoyed again by the accusing note in her voice. Why? I'm vegetarian, Lily stated. Meat is murder. Okay. I'm sorry, I didn't know, I told her, but I'm glad you remembered that about yourself. Maybe it's a sign your memory's coming back. Maybe, but in the meantime, what am I going to eat, she asked plaintively. I'm starving. I took a deep breath. Calm down, I told myself. Remember, she's in a very stressful situation. I'm sure she doesn't mean to be rude. I could make you some plain pasta with olive oil and cheese, I offered. Okay, she said, without much enthusiasm. I did that, which took another 20 minutes. By the time we sat down to eat, my linguine bolognese was stone cold. I watched with my jaw clenched as Lily ate a few bites of pasta, picked the tomatoes out of her salad, and lined them up on the edge of her plate, nibbled a little lettuce, and then pushed the whole plate aside. I guess I'm not as hungry as I thought, she said with a little laugh. She leaned back and gave a huge yawn. Wow, I am completely exhausted. Would you mind very much if I left the cleanup to you? I'd love to help, but after what I've been through, I think I sh should just really get some sleep. I could barely summon the will to nod. Whatever else Lily was, she was clearly a first-class user. I took my time cleaning up the kitchen, trying to work off the irritation I was feeling. Scrubbing pots made me feel better. By the time I was done, Lily was in the bedroom we were sharing with the door closed. There was no light coming from the crack at the bottom. I sat down in the living room to read and wait for my other friends to come home. I hoped their evening had been as pleasant as mine had been annoying. They came in just before midnight. George was describing the incredible castle and the fabulous meal when Bess came out of their shared bedroom. Has anyone seen my oatmeal cleansing milk? She asked. I left it on the bureau this morning, but now it's not there. Nan, did you borrow it? I shook my head. Not me. Then I remembered, um, maybe Lily did. I know she borrowed your robe from your room when she took her bath. Maybe she took the cleansing milk as well. Check the bathroom. Bess did. She came out a moment later holding an empty tube. Looks like she liked it, she said. She used the whole thing up, and there's more than half a tube in there. Oh no, I said wincing. I should have told her not to go into anyone's room while they weren't there, but I didn't see her until she was coming out. Sorry about that. Bess smiled wryly. It's not a big deal, she said. It's just face wash. Oh well, I guess Lily just has a thing for other people's stuff, especially mine. By the way... How was your evening with her? George asked me. Don't ask, I said gloomily. Lily was starting to give me a headache. I felt sorry for her, and I really wanted to know what had happened to her, but she wasn't making it easy to like her. The sooner I could be, I could solve her case and say goodbye to her, the happier I'd be. In the morning, I looked out the window and saw gray skies and fat raindrops rolling down the glass panes. We talked about going to see the ruins at Ostia Antica, but the whole complex was outdoors. Given the weather, it seemed that trip would have, have to wait another day. All the better, I thought. Now I could whisk Willie to the American Embassy, hopefully find out from them who she was, and notify her family and friends that she needed to be taken care of. I might even be rid of her by lunchtime. The thought gave me a sense of purpose, and I hurried through my shower and breakfast. Bess, George, and Anastel had decided to spend the morning seeing the sights in Vatican City. Are you sure you won't join us? Aunt Estelle asked me and Lily as we drank our breakfast cappuccino. The mosaics in the basilica are breathtaking, and of course you shouldn't miss Michelangelo's Pieta. Lily looked interested. No thanks, I said quickly, before she could get a word in. I wish we, we could, but we've got to get Lily straightened out. I'm sure there's someone out there who's very worried about her. Don't forget, we're meeting Frank and Joe for lunch at 
at uh, one Tremere Lee, Beth said. I won't, I promised. I'll meet up with you guys there, okay? I carried Lily's and my cup to the sink, and then we headed out. We were lucky enough to get a cab right away in spite of the rain. I spent the whole ride coaching Lily on walking past the guards at the embassy gates. They won't hurt you, I promised. They may look scary to you, but they're not the bad guys. The feeling you got yesterday when you saw them was powerful, I know, but it's not rational. They're there to protect the embassy, that's all. You need to keep telling yourself that. I know you're right, Lily said. I'll try to control myself. A few minutes later, we pulled up across the street. I paid the driver and we got out. Lily was pale. When I gave her a questioning look, she nodded. I'm all right. Good girl, I said approvingly. We crossed the street and walked past the guards without incident. Yes. Inside, we had to go through a metal detector manned by another guard. I could see that Lily was breathing faster, but she got through it all. So far, so good. We spoke to a receptionist and were directed to the consular section. A plump, balding man with round glasses ushered us into his office where I explained Lily's problem. I'm hoping that she might be in one of your missing persons reports and we can figure out from that who she is and where she belongs, I concluded. The consular agent who'd introduced himself as Bill Lutz adjusted his glasses. Amnesia, goodness, this is one of the most unusual cases I've come across, he said. Let me have a look. He turned to his computer and typed a few commands. About 20 headshot, headshots popped up, and he turned the screen so that Lily and I could see as he scrolled through them. I don't see anyone who looks like you, Lily, I said. Addressing Mr. Lutz, I added, is this all there is? That's all we have in our regular person missing persons file at present, he confirmed. However, we also have a number of files on American children who have allegedly been abducted by one or the other of their parents, you know, in custody cases. Let's have a look through those. She's a bit odd for a custody abduction, but you never know. He typed a few more commands and more headed headshots popped up on the screen. We scanned them all, but once again, there was no one there who looked like Lily. Most of the kids pictured were under 10. I was starting to feel discouraged. Is there any place else you can think of that we might look? I appealed to Mr. Lutz. I'm afraid not, he said, shaking his head. I suggest that we take a photo of the young lady right now, and I'll get it out to law enforcement agencies in the U.S. I'll arrange that right now. He picked up the phone and spoke into it briefly, then hanging up, he went on. I'll be frank, though. Uh, I'm not sure how effective, how effective this will be. The FBI and the police have thousands of missing person cases, and the chances of the right person seeing the photo are all quite small. Lily's eyes were welling with tears. No one is looking for me, she said. She whispered. I felt a spurt of pity. I patted her arm. Don't worry. We're not giving up, I said. There's still the Canadian consulate to turn. Good luck, Mr. Lutz told us as as we got up to leave. We stopped off in the passport section and got Lily's picture taken, then headed out. It had stopped raining, and according to my map, the Canadian consulate was relatively nearby, so we decided to walk. After a few blocks, the neighborhood changed, becoming more residential and decidedly less luxurious. We were walking down a narrow street lined with nondescript houses when Lily stopped suddenly. What's wrong? I asked, getting ready to run after her if something had freaked her out. But she had a frown of concentration on her face. This place is familiar, she said slowly. I recognize it. I've been here before. My pulse sped up. Lily, that's great. Maybe your memory is starting to come back for real. Lily walked to the end of the block, then turned and gazed down an even narrower street to her left. I feel like I should go this way, she said. It was the opposite direction from the consulate, but I wasn't worried about that. Fine, let go of your instinct where your instinct leads you. I said, it should, it could well be that we'll learn something about you. Lily led the way, peering from house to house as we walked slowly down the little street. A thin middle-aged woman with iron gray hair with a shapeless ba black dress was sweeping to uh, a stoop with short, vigorous strokes. <clears throat> she paused as we came level with her, her eyes narrowing as she watched us. Suddenly, she darted down the steps and seized Lily by the arm. Lily shrieked. 
her arm being clutched and shaking by the woman who was shaking it violently. My Italian was good, just good enough. After a moment of confusion, I thought I understood what she was saying. You, you, I've got you now. Chapter 10, Frank, Tag Team Tactics. I crumpled up the paper bag that had held our breakfast rolls. Then, taking careful aim, I lobbed it at my sleeping brother. It was a direct hit, right in the middle of his forehead. <laughs> Joe, Joe mumbled. He sat up in bed, eyes wild, hair sticking straight up. Rise and shine, I told him. I got you breakfast. Joe glared at me. Do you know that you suck? He said bitterly. What can I say? It's just who I am, I told him. Come on, get up. It's after eight o'clock. I've been up for an hour. I already went out and got rolls and coffee and checked the email. I indicated the laptop, which was open in front of me on the desk. Yeah, yeah, well, you aren't you special, Joe grumbled, but he climbed out of bed. Pulling a pair of jeans on over his boxers, he opened the door of our dorm room and disappeared in the direction of the bathroom. When he reappeared a few moments later, his hair was wet and he looked more human. After eight, we should all get going to the dig, he said, even if we're handing in our resignations. It's good to get there on time. I shook my head. It's raining. I don't think there's any dig going on today. Joe stopped short and gave me a painted look. So, if we don't have to be anywhere special, why exactly did you get me up? Just because we don't have to get to the work uh, at the dig doesn't mean there isn't plenty of other work to do, I said. Remember the mission? The mission. The mission. That rings a bell. Oh, right. Yes, the mission. Joe sat down at his desk where I'd set our coffees and rolls and picked up my chocolate croissant or whatever they call croissants in Italy. He stuffed half of it into his mouth in one bite. Frank, we solved the case yesterday, remember? He mumbled through full mouth. We're basically done. What's the rush? I snatched the croissant out of his hand. That's mine, and we're not done. You of all people should know that we never say mission accomplished until all the loose ends are tied. How many times have we had cases completely fall apart on us when we thought they were over? Not going to happen this time. You're just mad because I'm the one who cracked it, Joe grumbled. Ignoring that one, I went to my computer and clicked the mouse. <clears throat> An ATAC dossier opened up on the screen. Here's the file ATAC put together on Caitlin Boggs. What there is of it, I said. Joe moved over to stand behind me, peering over my shoulder at the screen. At the top left corner was a small, grainy passport-style photo. It showed a young, it showed a young woman. A uh, young girl with a heart-shaped face. She looked as if she might be pretty, but like so many passport photos, this one was basically a mugshot, her eyes blank, her face set in a weird expression, halfway between a smile and a sneer. Her hair was pulled back into a tight ponytail. The photo was of such poor quality that you couldn't quite make out her hair or eye color. This was taken three years ago when she was 16, I said, reading from the file. Who knows if she looks anything like this now? Girls change a lot from 16 to 19. It says her eyes are brown and her hair is auburn. Okay, that's no help at all, Joe said. What else did Atac dig up? Very little, I said, shaking my head. She grew up in Gross Point, Michigan. Parents got divorced when she was eight. She lived with her mom, only child. Seems like they had money troubles. Gross Pont. Uh, Gross Point is a wealthy area, and Caitlin went uh, to a couple of exclusive boarding schools, but Mom declared bankruptcy three times. Dad's a banker, so he has a lot of money, but apparently he's never been so good at remembering to pay child support, and Mom likes to live large, according to this report. She spends at least four months of every year at various European spas and ski resorts. Ouch, Joe said. So, Caitlin is a poor little rich girl, huh? Sounds that way. She has a juvenile record, too, but it's been sealed by the court, and ATAC hasn't been able to get it unsealed yet, so we don't know what she did. Let me take three guesses, Joe said. Shoplifting or some form of petty theft? Oh, wait, that was only one guess. Classic behavior for a kid who's acting out because her parents ignore her. I nodded. It also fits in with what everyone's been saying about her being a shifty character, doesn't it? And it fits with our case, too. So here's the recap, Joe walked around the room. 
ticking points off of his finger. Sam Lewis arrives to work on the dig, accompanied by his girlfriend, Caitlin Boggs. Sam gets Caitlin a job off the books doing office work at bs and Caitlin, and this is where we're guessing, steals some artifacts from bs and for Sam to sell. Sam disappears for a few days, presumably with Caitlin. Then Sam turns up again when he's caught trying to sell artifacts online. Caitlin is still missing. And Sam is scared of something, I added. So the big questions are, where is Caitlin now? And what is Sam scared of? Joe finished. Kind of makes you wonder what they were doing during the time they disappeared, I said. That is the million dollar question, isn't it? Joe agreed. We looked at each other. Well, one thing's obvious, I said. Whatever the answers are, the place to start looking for them is at BSNT. Let's stop by the dig first, Joe suggested. Vanessa will probably be at the office. She said something about needing to catch up on paperwork. I bet I can ask her to come up with some legitimate excuse for us to go down to BSNT. That way we have a cover story if we need one. Good plan. We hopped on the metro and took it to the Coliseum stop. From there, we headed up and around the Palatine Hill, going through the staff entrance. Walking around the huge ruins in the rain was eerie, without the hordes of tourists there. It was silent and otherworldly. Shreds of fog drifted between the drowned columns like lost ghosts. As it turned out, even though no one was working on the quadrants, there was plenty of activity at the dig site. I spotted Jeff and Kyra going into the trailer where the artifacts were catalogued. As the door opened, I caught still of a tall, stooped figure already inside, Claude Bonaire. Apparently, they were all spending the rainy day studying the latest finds. Vanessa was in her office, as Joe had predicted. He explained to her what we needed, and she nodded. That's easy, she said. I actually need some more shipping crates sent from bs and anyway. You can go down there and get them for me. I'll call Joanne and let her know you're coming. Just Joe, I said quickly. I'd appreciate if you don't mention me. Vanessa looked intrigued, but didn't say anything as she pulled out her phone and quickly set up the crate pickup. Is there any news on my problem? She asked in a hesitant voice as she closed her phone. We contacted some of our colleagues who work in the Organized Crime Tax Force Task Force in London, I told her. They've been watching Fat Hamish for another case, so they know all about him already. Apparently, they're trying, they're planning some kind of major sting operation, and it's likely that in a couple of days, Fat Hamish will have much more pressing things to worry about than collecting debts from your brother, Joe added. We'll keep you posted, but I think your brother should be in the clear soon. Vanessa put her hand on her chest. Oh, that, that is such a relief to hear, she said, closing her eyes for a moment. So Tony will be safe, and I won't have to keep making the fake pots you boys are lifesavers anything you need from me anything at all you've just got to ask good to know thank you i said then joe and i headed toward the train station we reviewed our strategy as we walked from the ter- the terminal in C- uh, civitia vecchia to the bs and t warehouse all you have to do is get joanna into the warehouse and Keep her there for a few minutes, I told Joe. Oh, and let's sync our phones so I can listen in on your conversation. That way, I'll know if you're coming back towards the offices. Our phones, in addition to all the other excellent features, had a function that allowed one of them to work as a mic and the other as a receiver so that conversations one of us was having could be heard by the other person, even at a distance. The range wasn't huge. The listening phone couldn't pick up a signal from more than 500 yards away, but it it should work for what we were doing today. We stopped and quickly set up the phones. It meant Joe had to wear a hands-free device like people use when they drive. But that was common enough these days that it wouldn't seem suspicious. So have you come up with any uh, with some conversation topics to keep her busy? I asked as the offices came in sight. Joe snorted. I don't need topics, Frank. I know how to talk to girls. If all else fails, I can just tell her how pretty she is. I don't think that will work on Joanna, I warned. She doesn't strike me as a type who falls for pickup lines. How would you know? Joe said with a grin. Did you try one on her? (laughs) I whacked him on the side of his head. Shut up. Listen, I noticed a flag hanging over her desk that I didn't recognize. So 
So I looked it up on the line last night. It's Cor it's Corsican. I suspect she's Corsican too. She was wearing a pin with the same symbol that was on the flag. If you ran out of things to talk to her about, you could ask her about that. Corsica, is that somewhere in Greece? Joe asked. I shook my head sadly. Your ignorance is monumental. You know that? No, it's not Greece, dummy. It's an island off the Italian coast, pretty close to Rome, maybe 200 miles away. It's where Napoleon Bonaparte was born. Napoleon, Joe repeated, but wasn't he French? Well, Corsica is controlled by France, even though most of the people who live there are of Italian descent. In fact, I read last night that there's a pretty serious movement for Corsica, Corsican independence. Some of the pro-independence groups have even threatened violence. Fascinating, Joe said, pretending to yawn. I'm sure she'll be riveted when I talk when I start talking about Corsican independence. You never know, I pointed out, just trying to give you some extra ammunition, little brother. You worry too much. I'll be fine, Joe assured me. Okay, you stay out of sight. I'm going in. I watched him walk toward the office building. Right before he went inside, he spake into his mic. Can you hear me? He turned around, and I gave him a thumbs up from where he from where I stood. He nodded and went in. I listened while he explained who he was. Thanks to Vanessa's phone call, Joanne had been expecting him, so he had no trouble in, get, in getting her to take him out to the warehouse. As soon as they disappeared into the shadowy interior, I hurried through the door and over to the filing cabinets by the far wall. I knew I had to work fast, and I did, yanking open the file drawers and scanning for personal personnel files. As my eyes skimmed over every file label, I listened to Joe trying to make conversation with Joanna. It went something like this. Joe, so what's a beautiful girl like you doing hiding away in a dingy place like this? Joanna, no reply. Joe, clearing his throat. So, the shipping business, huh? Oh, that's interesting. Joanna, it's my job. Joe, haha, that's honest. Hey, what about Rome? What a great city, great nightlife. I bet you go out to a different club every night of the week. Joanna, no reply. <laughs> my brother was striking out. Even though I knew it meant I'd have less time to snoop, I couldn't help grinning to myself. I'd warned him she was tough. I closed the door I'd been looking in, which seemed to be all cargo manifests for the Sitavikia fleet, and opened the next one. Hmm, more of the same. Joe, those are some big dogs you've got there. Do you really need guard dogs for a place like this? It seems pretty quiet. Joanna, it's best to be prepared for anything. Joe, prepared for what? Have you ever had any incidents? Joanna, the crates are right over there. Uh-oh, he was really striking out big time. They were already almost done with their business in the warehouse. I quickly opened a third drawer. Yes, personnel read the label on the front hanging file. I was reasonably sure that meant personnel. Now, if I could just find some reference to Caitlin Boggs in here. Joe, starting to sound tense. So, do you live in Rome? Joanna, no. Joe, oh really, where do you live? Joanna, are you going to take the crates or not? <laughs> Man, she was all business. I needed more time, not least because all the labels and files were in Italian. I quickly texted Joe, keep her there. I need more time. Joe, sounding increasingly desperate. So I noticed there's a Corsican flag hanging over your desk. Are you Corsican? Joanna, surprised. You know the Corsican flag? Joe laughs. Doesn't everybody? Joanna, no, not everyone. I would not say that. Joe, well, it's very recognizable. You know, I've always thought that Corsica should be independent from France. It doesn't make any sense, especially since most Corsicans aren't even French by descent. Joanna, I completely agree. We are Italian in our language, our culture, our roots. But you know, most people don't even realize Corsica is struggling for independence. I'm impressed by how much you know. Joe, modestly, I guess I just like to be informed. <laughs> Oh, he was good. <laughs> I had to give him that. My little brother was a world-class con artist. You'd never guess that I just fed him that information ten minutes ago. They were chatting away now, Joe feeding her questions, and Joanna talking about the independence movement. Although her voice stayed calm, it was clear to me that a free Corsica was near and dear to her heart. 
I closed the personnel drawer. As far as I could tell, there was no file on Caitlin Boggs. Not surprising. Since she'd apparently been employed unofficially, but still, it was disappointing. Where could she have vanished to? Maybe there'd be some sign of her on Joanna's desk. I'd hurried over and started shift sifting through papers. Near the bottom of a stack of messages, I found a pink phone message slip addressed to Joanna. It was dated from the previous week, and it said, Mr. Mazzini called. Wants you to come out to the island to inspect progress of pro uh, project. It was signed, Caitlin. Yes, there it was, a sign that she'd been there. That she was real and not a phantom. I wondered if Joe could come up with a way to ask her about ask about her without making Joanna suspicious. As I glanced around the room, seeking inspiration, my eye landed on a smallish photo that clung on the wall next to the Corsican flag. It showed us a tall, craggy-faced man smashing a bottle over the prow of a ship, a launching ceremony, I guessed, and the man in the photo was Claude Bonaire, the millionaire from our dig. I did a double take. What in the world? It was so unexpected. What was a photo of Claude Bonaire doing in the offices of BS&T? Wait, wasn't Bonaire a shipping magnet? I hadn't told Jeff that. I ran back to the file cabinet and opened the drawer of shipping manifests again. I yanked one of the manifests out of its file, the BS&T company logo, a large B with a smaller S&T stacked right next to it, was prominent at the bottom of the page. And now I was paying attention. I saw what I hadn't noticed before. Underneath the S&T, which presumably stood for shipping and transit, small letters spelled out the name that the B stood for. It was Bonaire. So, BS&T was Bonaire Shipping and Transit. Claude Bonaire owned the company that shipped artifacts from the dig, the company for which Caitlin Boggs had worked and from which she and Sam had stolen the artifacts Sam tried to sell. My head was spinning. This was a new twist indeed. Was Bonaire involved somehow in the stolen artifacts or with Caitlin's disappearance? Jeff had said that Bonaire spent a lot of time talking to Sam. Were they involved in some scheme together, or was it just a coincidence? I thought of Joe that morning, saying the case was closed, and me arguing with him. Usually I like winning arguments with my little brother, but this time I just had a sinking feeling that things were just about to get a little more complicated. Chapter 11. Nancy, Examining a Life The old woman shouted again, shaking Lily's arm. Let me go! Help! Lily shrieked. She scrapped. She scrabbled ineffectively at the woman's fingers. Don't let her hurt me. Make her let me go. Somebody help me. I stood there with my mouth open in shock, watching the bizarre struggle. The elderly woman was, if anything, smaller and lighter than Lily, who was maybe five feet two and slender. I felt like I should put a hand on each of their heads and hold them apart from each other while they tried, uh, while they tired themselves. Instead, I gently but firmly pried the elderly woman's fingers off of Lily's arm. Then I pushed Lily behind me as I spoke to the woman. Me despacie, I said. Non parlamos buen, uh, buen italiano. Parla inglés? I speak little English, the woman said, still panting and shooting angry glances at Lily over my shoulder. I'm not sure why you are angry, I said. My friend here has lost her memory. She cannot remember anything. Do you know her? Si, sí, I know her. Si, sí, la ragazza. And the woman started rattling on in rapid Italian. I held up my hands pleadingly. Please, in English, I said. I'm sorry. The woman made an effort to pull herself together. I know her, she said. She rent room from me, and she no pay me. I have it tomorrow, 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 the woman mimicked Lily's breathy voice. But never she have money, never. Three weeks she owe me, and then, poof, she disappear. I have amnesia, Lily shrilled, as if the woman should somehow know this already. It wasn't my fault. I was trying to process all this. We'd found Lily's landlord. What a lucky chance. Now we'd certainly be able to find out more about Lily herself. Signora Alberti, we're very sorry, I said. Something happened to Lily. We're not sure what, but she has lost her memory. That's why she disappeared. She never meant to leave without paying the rent. I said this as sincerely as I could, though from what I'd seen of Lily, I was 
by no means certain it was true. Yeah, Lily agreed. She she folded her arms and sniffed. Hmm, Senora Alberta mut muttered, glaring at Lily with deep suspicion. Did she by chance sign a rental agreement? I asked. A document? Like that would have her name and probably other information like her parents or guardians' names or a home address in the States? I don't ask for a piece of paper, Senora Alberti's expression darkened. I'm an honest woman. I think others are honest too. I say, you live here, you pay me 100 euros every week. I give you nice room, wash clothes, that is all. Bright red patches were starting to appear on her cheeks, but she no pay. I'd be happy to pay what Lily owes you, I said quickly. I hoped it wouldn't be too much, but Signora Alberti was right. She deserved to be paid, and if she had the money, she'd be more likely to want to help us. I had a couple of traveler's checks with me that I could use to pay her if need be. One hundred euros every week, Signora Alberti announced. She owes for three weeks and five days. I take three hundred and fifty. I gulped. 350 euros was more than I had, but maybe she'd accept a down payment. I can give you 200 right now, and I promise to bring you the rest later today, I said, crossing my fingers that she'd say yes. Senora, Lily and I really need to get her into her room. We may be able to find something that tells us who she is. Senora Alberti pursed her lips. Non so, I took a deep breath. I really didn't want to do this, but it was an emergency. I can also give you my credit card to hold, I added. That way you'll know I, I will come back. Signora Alberti looked me over, then she nodded once. No credit card, she said. You think you I think I trust. Her withering glance at Lily said clearly enough what she didn't say in words. Thank you very much, I signed over the traveler's checks to her. Then she led me and Lily through a small dark foyer out into a tiny but sunny courtyard and to a room by itself at the far side. She unlocked the door with the key she took from her pocket of her shapeless black dress. I wait here, she said. Lily's room was not luxurious, but it was clean and pleasant. At least there were no dust bunnies or cobwebs, but clearly Lily wasn't much of a housekeeper. Crumpled clothes were strewn over a single bed. The table and chairs and the terracotta tiled floor... American fashion magazines were tossed carelessly here and there. An MP3 player in a framed photo sat on a small nightstand. Lily crossed to the photo and picked it up. I heard the sharp intake of her breath as she stared at me. That's Sam, she said. Sam and me. She was remembering. I hurried to her and peered over her shoulder. The photo was of Lily and a tall guy with the shaggy, dirty blonde or light brown hair and a lopsided smile. His face was tilted down, Lily's tilted up so that they were gazing into each other's eyes. Lily looked radiant. They were arm in arm on what appeared to be a snowy college campus. Behind them I could see brick buildings and crowds of bundled up student types. Sam, I repeated, trying to keep the urgency out of my voice. Is he your boyfriend? Lily nodded. I could hear from the tremble in her voice as she was trying not to cry. He loves me. He always takes care of me. What's his last name? She was silent for a long moment. Then she looked at, at me, her eyes brimming. I, I can't remember. I can't remember where this picture was taken or who took it. I just know that Sam and we love each other and I don't know where he is. After the, a second, the tears fell. She didn't sob. Big drops just ran silently down her cheeks, as if there was an ocean behind her eyes. Somehow she seemed even more forlorn now than she had when I first found her. We'll find him, I promised, putting an arm around her shoulders. And you know, he's got to be searching for you, too. You can tell by the look on his face how much he loves you. Lily nodded, the tears flowing faster. I gave her shoulders a gentle squeeze, then left her to collect herself while I prowled around the room. But there was nothing more to find. No passport tucked away in a drawer, no credit card receipts, no wallet with driver's license or student ID. Nor was there any mail, no postcard or letters addressed to her, no computer with email. The magazines had all been brought at newsstands, so there was no address labels on them. I bit my lip. 
This case was getting frustrating. How could a person's life be so hard to track down? My stomach gave a twinge, reminding me that it had been a while since breakfast. I checked my watch and was startled to see that it was already past noon. We were going to be late for lunch with Joe and Frank Hardy. The Hardys, they might be able to help me, I thought. First of all, talking things out with them would be useful in itself. They were experienced investigators and might be able to come up with some suggestions for turning up new leads. But even more than that, through them, I could perhaps get ATAC to use its manpower and technological power to uncover Lily's real identity. We should get going, I said. We've got a lunch date. Maybe I'll just stay here, Lily said in a dreary voice. I don't really feel like eating. Cheer up. We're going to figure this out, I said briskly. My friends Frank and Joe are detectives too, and we're getting somewhere. We really are. We found where you live, and we found out about Sam, and another idea struck me and we might be able to figure out from this photo what college you go to. I guess, Lily didn't look up. In the meantime, you need to eat, and so do I. So come on, let's go have some lunch. She followed me obediently out of her room and across the courtyard. We said goodbye to Senora Alberti, and I promised her we'd be back with the rest of the rent that evening. Then we went out to the street and hailed a taxi. I gave Lily a discreet, sidelong glance as she settled into the back seat of the taxi. She stared mutely out the window. Her face looked wan and sad. I, al I almost wa uh, wished for her old jittery, uh, for the old jittery Lily. This silent shadow is a bit worrisome. Unfortunately, traffic was awful, and even the skill of our driver, a grisly a grizzled man who didn't speak to us, but steered in and out of tiny openings with ferocious concentration, couldn't keep us moving. The closer we got to the river, the worse things got. I tried in vain not to fidget as we came to a stop for the third time in less than a block. Masses of tourists and office workers on their lunch break flowed toward the car, oblivious to me sitting inside twaddling my thumbs. After we'd been in the cab for about 20 minutes, I decided we might be better off walking. We were a few blocks west of our destination, but there appeared to be some sort of demonstration blocking the street ahead of us. And I was afraid that if we stayed in the cab, we'd still be sitting there three hours later. I paid the driver and climbed out, Lily in tow. This way, I said, taking her hand and leading her down the street. We'd have to find a way around the demonstration. Bunches of people wearing white headbands waved signs and shouted out in fr front of a massive brick building with white columns and row upon row of windows. I looked at the signs. Of course they were in Italian, but some had pictures on them rather than words. The picture that was on most of them was a striking drawing of a black head silhouetted on a white background. The head was wrapped in a white bandana, much like the headbands the protesters were wearing. I still had Lily by the hand. Suddenly, I felt her grip tighten spasmodically on, my, on mine. I glanced at her. Her eyes were two circles, perfectly round with terror. As she gaped at something over my shoulder, I whirled to see what she was looking at. One of the protesters, a big, hulking, dark-haired man, wearing a white bandana and plain green army fatigues, was staring back at us with a shocked look on his face. I had only a split second to study him before my arm was nearly jerked out of its socket. Run, Lily said breathlessly in my ear. Run. And then, with the strength I had never dreamed she was capable of, she dragged me away through the crowd. Who is that man? I demanded as I stumbled after her. Why are we running? Lily didn't answer, just plowed ahead. I turned to look over my shoulder, hoping I could get a better look at the guy. As it turned out, I got a very good look at him because he was coming after us, moving fast, shoving people out of his way right and left. There was an ugly scowl on his face. Was he someone uh, else that Lily had ripped off? Then I saw his hand come out of his pocket and beckon to someone off to his right. My breath caught in my throat as I saw the wink of a metal. He had a knife. Whoever this man was, he meant business. And I really didn't want to find out what kind of business. Chapter 12. Joe answers at last. Well, of course, Pascal Paoli, the father of the Corsican nation, was one of the most brilliant men of the brilliant age, Joanna Paoli said. 
I perched on the edge of a, a stack of shipping crates and tried to keep my expression fascinated. Of course, I agreed. I don't know if you know this, but Pascal Paoli wrote the constitution that Corsica adopted in 1755, more than 20 years before the creation of the American constitution, Joanna went on. It was far ahead of its time. It even gave women the right to vote. She'd been lecturing away happily for the last 10 minutes without me contributing more than the occasional hmm or a yes. But with her gaze on me, I felt I had to say a bit more. No, I wasn't aware of that, I said. Wow, that's, that's true genius. Yes, I know, Joanna finished for me. Her green eyes were sparkling and her cheeks were slightly pink. She was awfully pretty maybe a little too obsessed with Corsican history, but I was willing to overlook it as long as I could keep her keep staring at her. The, the Genoese could not control Corsica, so they gave it to the French, Joanna was saying. The French, what do they know about the Corsican soul? They claim to be for liberty, equality, and fraternity, but all they have given us is two centuries of oppression. My cell phone vibrated, and I sneaked a discreet look at the screen. Two more minutes read Frank's latest text. Not a problem, I thought, hiding a grin. I was doing a stellar job of keeping Joanna occupied. True, it had been touch and go there at the beginning, but she was so frosty to me. And yes, it was also true that that the way I'd gotten her to open up had been to use Frank's topic, Corsican independence. Hard to believe that my big brother had actually supplied an icebreaker that worked on a girl. But whatever, Joanna was now responding perfectly to the Joe Hardy charm. I could keep this up all day. I was even starting to wonder if she'd go on a, out on a date with me. I wondered how she felt about younger men. I thought of my next line. Paoli, I said, wink, wrinkling my forehead. That's your last name, too, isn't it? Are you any relation to... I couldn't remember the guy's first name, so I just used his title. To um, the father of Corsica? Joanna's cheeks turned even pinker. Only a very distant connection, she said, looking down. But yes, Pascal Paoli is my ancestor. Wow, you must be very proud, I said. It's kind of like um, like being related to George Washington. My phone vibrated again. I glanced at it while Joanna was gazing modestly at her feet. Gag me, I read, done here. <laughs> Meet at train station. Ask about Claude Bonaire. He owns bs and My eyebrows rose. That was interesting. The shipping crates I'd supposedly come here for, flattened for transport, were stacked on a wheeled dolly. I took the handle and began pushing it toward the front of the warehouse. Joanna walked beside me. Hey, so the guy who owns your company works on our dig, I said. Joanna shrugged. Yes, that's right, she agreed. What's he like, I asked. He seems a little like uh, obsessed with that old Roman king dude, Claudius. Frank had told me about Bonaire's Claudius lecture. Joanna smiled scornfully. He's a silly man, she said. He believes he is the descendant of Claudius. He has even had a great, uh, had a genealogist create a family tree showing how he is related. He worships Claudius. Kind of like she worshiped Pascal Paoli, I thought, but I didn't say. His proudest possession is a fragment of a scroll that was believed to be part of Claudius's library, Joanna laughed. But he, he is harmless. He stays out of my way. Hmm, I wasn't sure what, if anything, Frank wanted me to find out, but I couldn't really think of any more questions about Bonaire. I decided to take a shot at something else on my own. By the way, I had a buddy on the dig, I said, reaching the loading bay. I parked the dolly and wiped my forehead. He told me his girlfriend was working for BS and T. Caitlin Boggs. I'm wondering if you've ever seen if you've seen her lately. I've been trying to get in touch with her. Joanna's eyes went blank for a fraction of a second. Then she shook her head. I don't know who you mean, she said. There's nobody else working here, just me and the warehouse men. If I hadn't seen that brief flash of something in her eyes, I would have believed her. But I had seen it, and I knew Joanna was lying. Why, though? Surely she wasn't worried about me reporting bs &T for hiring undocumented workers. Not that I was an expert on Italian labor laws, but I couldn't believe it would be that big of a deal. Why else would she lie about Caitlin having worked there? Unless she had something to do with Caitlin's disappearance. I didn't see any way to push the questions at the moment without raising her suspicions, but maybe I could arrange another meeting at, say, a nice restaurant. I really enjoyed talking to you, I said. How about you and me? Yes, it has been interesting, Joanna interrupted, but I must get back to work now. Tell Vanessa that if she needs more crates, I will send one of my men to the dig. Well, 
I'll bring the dolly back later, too. There is no need. We have hundreds of them. Goodbye. I winced. It was a brush off. No question about it. She was holding out her hand to shake. I took it, and with a brief cool nod, she went striding back toward her office. Thoughtfully, I headed for the train station. The drizzle had eased off now, but the air was unpleasantly damp and clammy. Frank was waiting for me on one of the benches. Did you catch that last bit? I asked, throwing myself down beside him. You mean the part where Joanna blew, blew you off? Frank asked, smirking. I heard it. I jabbed with my elbow. She blew me off all right, but not because she didn't like me. The old Joe Hardy charm was working just fine until I mentioned Caitlin. That's when she shut down. Shut down? Shut you down, you mean, Frank said, but he was frowning. I'm positive she was lying, I told him as we climbed aboard the train. Which makes you wonder why we chose our seats and Frank helped me stow the crates on the overhead rack. Then he resumed. If Caitlin stopped showing up for work because she and Sam went off on some crazy trip, like we've been assuming, Joanna wouldn't need to hide that from anyone. But if Caitlin didn't disappear of her own free will, Exactly, I said with a nod. Frank ran his fingers through his short, dark hair in frustration. I don't know where this is all going, he said. We came here to investigate a possible theft ring. So far, we've got nothing on the theft ring, but we do have a missing girl and a suspicious shipping company run by a beautiful Corsican nationalist. And I owned and owned by an American nutshell, nutball who thinks he's the Emperor Claudius's great-great-great-grandson, I reminded him. Let's not forget the nutball. And I'm going to stop right there, and we'll pick up on the last bit of our story on the next, the next clip. Bye.